Don't ever let anyone tell you you can't invert a latex glove while wearing a respirator. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. It's the final episode on the PM Research Steam Engine project. We've made it work. Now, let's make it pretty. I'm going to make some custom hardware, I'm going to paint it, and most importantly, I'm going to make a really nice base so that it's not sitting on one, two, three blocks like a chump. So let's go. Step one is to figure out what kind of base to put under my engine, what kind of look I'm going for. When you go looking for reference materials, you know, mostly what you find are photographs of restored later engines, which are all typically going to be, first of all, very large, and they're typically sitting on either a custom cast iron base or a poured concrete base, which is obviously not period. So being such an early engine, that leaves us with drawings of period engines, and some of them are shown with what appear to be cast iron bases, but a lot of the times you just can't tell what the base is supposed to be because of course these are drawings, so you're at the mercy of whatever detail the artist felt like showing. But when there is detail available, it's typically some sort of fabric, cobbled masonry, uh, some sort of stone or brick. Uh, brick is sort of the most classic look that people go for with these engine bases, but it's actually pretty hard to find reference photos for brick bases on these engines, so that may be a little bit of an anachronism. Most frequently they seem to have cast iron bases just bolted down to whatever stone foundation they could cobble together. In any case, uh, I think I am going to go for a brick look here because I'm a sucker for that. And so I'm going to make it out of wood and then create a brick treatment around the outside of it. According to this modern measuring tool, the length needs to be three quarters the length of the stride of King Edward's favorite hunting dog. I have this piece of scrap here that's just the right thickness to where if I make three pieces and laminate them together, it'll make a nice little block the right height. And I don't have the right kind of woodworking tools for this. All I have is this miter saw, but you go to war with the armor you have. And if I just flip this guy around, it does a pretty good job. This saw has the blade shadow uh, feature, uh, which is so much better than the laser lines that some of them have. Those lasers you can't see at all in daylight, whereas the blade shadow line uh, not only works in daylight, but shows you the actual profile of the teeth. So you can get really precise cuts that are repeated from one side to the other, which is great for jobs like this where the saw is not quite big enough for what I want it to do. This scrap had a bunch of old paint and stuff on it, so I spent some quality time with the sander to clean all of that off and get the blocks ready for lamination. Now, time to join these pieces together. So obviously I went to the welder and, you know, I looked and I just I could not find the right settings for wood. And I don't know why. Do you, maybe you have to use TIG for this? I'm not sure. Well, plan B, I found this stuff on the shelf. It's wood glue. I think it's Dutch. And from the data sheet, it appears to be like Loctite, but for plants. So I'll give it a shot. I think it may work. So I'm going to put this uh, fairly liberally here on my three pieces. And then I will clamp these up and let that cure overnight. Next, I want to make some kind of attempt to flatten out the sides. I don't have a proper block plane or a planer machine or any of the right tools for this. I did find this Stanley Sureform tool in the drawer. I have no idea why I own this, but it kind of worked. It wasn't a lot of fun, but it did kind of do the job of flattening out the edges there. And I did the same treatment on the ends. And then I hit it again with the sander, of course. And well, that's the result. It's pretty decently square and not terrible for, you know, a machinist, but I think it'll work. Now I'm going to mark the center line here and I'm going to cut a trench all the way down the center of this thing. Why am I doing that? It's going to be a drain basically. So eventually this engine is going to get built into a steam plant and the steam plant is going to have a sump that runs underneath the whole thing. And so everything that can drip oil or water is going to go into that sump. So this is like a drainage trench that runs down the entire length of the engine and will someday feed into the sump under the steam plant. So I drilled that out with the Forstner bit and then squared it up reasonably well with the chisel. This won't be visible so it doesn't have to look great. All right, now time to disassemble the engine, which is a little sad because it's running really well and I hate to take it apart, but it's gotta be done. One neat thing though, is you can see here, the wearing in starting to happen on the valve face there. You can see the horizontal streaks there starting to remove the machining marks. So that's pretty cool. You can actually see the engine wearing in. It's only been run about half a dozen times, but it's pretty cool that you can see the process in action already. 
To mount the engine on the base, of course, I'm going to have to finally drill out those bosses that people have been asking me to drill out for, I don't know, six months or so. So I mounted this up on the mill and lined it up on the crosshead rail there as usual. And I tried measuring these and it didn't work very well. What seemed to work the best was honestly just eyeballing the center of the first boss there. And uh, once I was happy with the position of that, I tried using the DRO to locate the other bolt holes. But following the drawing uh, for where these bosses are supposed to be, they seem to be off by between 10 and 50 thou. Like some of them are really quite off. And I know my machining is not great, but it's not that far off. So there's something fishy with the casting in this regard. So what seemed to work the best was just eyeballing the center of each boss, honestly. And I just noted the DRO positions of each one so I could come back and drill them through after center drilling. And that worked out great. They all ended up visually nice looking, even if, uh, the bolt pattern that results is not exactly what the drawing says it's supposed to be. And this was kind of an interesting exercise in uh, getting around to see what I was doing. This was uh, a little tricky because I had to eyeball the top of the boss. And then a little deburring and to deburr the tops of those bosses, I went, went in with my underside deburring tool because there wasn't space to do it from above. I love this tool. There's a link to this down below. I'm going to paint the engine next, and to do that I'm going to use this stuff. I've got an etching primer there for the cast iron, and I've got a burgundy engine block paint. And the reason I'm using that is because you need high temperature paint for this, obviously. The cylinder uh, gets very, very hot. In North America, the only two kinds of high temperature paint you can buy are engine block paint for hot rodders or barbecue paint. And the latter only comes in black. So this is what I'm going to try. The engine block paint only comes in about five colors, but luckily one of them was this burgundy that I think is going to look really nice. So I started by painting the etch primer on all of the cast iron areas. You don't have to worry about masking off the machined areas. If you just get some on there, just wipe it off with your finger and it's fine. And I am wearing a respirator rated for organic vapors here because the fumes from this primer and this paint are really something awful. And after that was done, I realized I'd forgotten to file off one of the sprues here on the base. So I went back and did that and then just touched up the primer there. Moment of truth now on the paint. It looked like a nice burgundy on the website, but on the label it looks pretty brown. So let's see which it actually is. And I think the good news is it is quite burgundy. That's quite lovely. I'm very pleased with that. So here we go. Here's our happy little steam engine chuffing away. Make it your own. Express yourself. We don't use any tracings here. I'm just here to teach you some techniques and unleash you on the world. This is your steam engine, your happy little steam engine. Look at it, chuffing away. See how happy it is. Look, people have already called me the Bob Ross of Machinist YouTube, so I'm going to lean into it. And don't do this with a brush that you care about because this high temperature paint will destroy it. The proper solvent for this stuff is methyl ethyl ketone, which you can't even get here anymore, which is probably for the best. It's pretty nasty stuff. But now you can buy this substitute chemical in paint stores, which is really not as good, and so the brushes don't get properly clean. Everybody says they hate painting, but I actually really like it. I think that's very satisfying. So this paint is outstanding, I have to say. The result was excellent. I mean, it went on very easily and uh, it looks great, I think. It does take a really long time to cure this high temperature paint. You have to let it cure for a full week, which is quite surprising. But that gives me lots of time to make hardware, and I have a lot of hardware to make. The kit came with a big pile of these filister head screws, not to be confused with filibuster screws, which just seem to go on and on. These are perfectly adequate for securing all the parts of the engine, but they aren't scale accurate. Like if this engine was full size, these would be giant slot headed screws, which you would never put on an engine. And they're very, very fussy to work with because the screwdriver keeps slipping out and you have to get all the holes lined up. So studs and nuts are much more pleasant and pleasant looking. First up are some studs to mount the engine to the base. And I found this nice piece of 316 stainless that I'm gonna use to make these. So I'm going to use the collet chuck for this and I will start by facing off the end. Now I've got a lot of stick out here, but I'm trying to do this in one setup because I have a lot of these to make. So I'm trying to come up with an easy process. So I faced it with a very light cut because of the stick out. And then I came in with a little bit of anchor lube on there and I cut the threads on there. So far so good. The threads went on quite easily. 316 stainless can be pretty ornery to work with, but so far so good. Now I'll round off the end nicely, and then I want to put some grooves below the threads to act as a key for the epoxy. Those are going to get epoxied into the base. So I'll come in with the parting tool and, ooh, yeah. 
Stickout caused the stock to flex, which caused it to work harden, which caused it to snap off. So I'll try that one more time, this time working very close to the call there, as close as I can, and snap, yeah. Plan C, coming in with a sharp nose tool this time instead of the parting blade, and I'll make a kind of a different style of groove, and that worked okay. And then I put the threads on second, just in case the stud broke again, and then I cut it off with a hacksaw rather than trying to part it off. And that seemed to work okay, but it was a lot of effort, so I don't know if I want to make them all this way. We'll do a test fit on the engine though, and the stud is kind of a tight fit in that hole. I'm not crazy about that, and the nut, which is a 540 nut, which is what I made the threads, does not fit. It does not clear the casting. Well, that is unfortunate. I just assumed this would be 540 hardware. The drawing doesn't specify but it turns out it needs to be 440. So uh, I went ahead and just made studs out of threaded rod because of course you can buy stainless steel threaded rod in all manner of small thread sizes. And I did however go on to make my own nuts and I'll explain why here in a moment, but I just drilled and tapped a whole batch of them at a time. And then I parted them off chamfering the front and back of each one with the file. And when you're between two nuts there, you can chamfer two of them at a time as you see there. And that is one down and 21 more to go. So here's a batch of six for the studs on the base. But let's talk about scale nuts for a moment because there's a proportion problem that happens when hardware gets really small. In the center here is kind of what a commercial 540 nut looks like. But you can see how the walls of it, if you like, are too thick. They don't look like a large full-size nut that's been scaled down. So here is the same 540 thread in a smaller hex profile, and you can see that it looks more proportionally correct. And on the left is a 440 nut with the same hex profile. Now you can see that the commercial nut in the center there is proportionally too large on the steam chest cover. It looks weird. It kind of sticks out on the sides and it just doesn't look like a scaled down nut. It looks like a toy. So that's why instead of using commercial nuts, I went ahead and made all my own nuts out of stainless bar stock. And uh, yeah, I needed uh, 22 of them in the 540 size and a bunch in some other sizes. You know, you made 12 that were too short and then another 18 that were the wrong thread size. Shut up, imperial fist shake. Now, even with custom made nuts, the 348 nuts that go on the bearing caps still won't clear the casting. And you can't buy stainless hex bar stock any smaller than 316, which is what I used. So instead what I did is I found these tiny little washers. I got lucky in my washer bin and I filed one side of them flat to clear the casting and that lifted the nuts up just enough so that they clear the curvature there. So this was kind of a lucky break. You'll see how this works in a minute. And amazingly, I did find that. Okay, paint is cured. Let's do a little test fit on the base and poop knuckles. I neglected the fact that the bearing area is wider. So yeah, I uh, made some little pieces to fit in there and uh, I'm gonna make this into kind of a cross shape. I considered just widening the whole base, but I kind of didn't like the way that was gonna look because most of the base was gonna be just kind of floating in space. So I wanted to make it more of a form fit. And so I glued these little pieces on there. And while I was at it, I also coated the inside of my drainage trench there in polyurethane just to protect it from water. It's not like it's gonna get flooded down there, but this might help a little. On to the brick treatment now. I ordered what I thought was embossed rigid polystyrene board that's used for creating brick walls and such in model railroading. It's a product that I'm quite familiar with and knew how to get good results from. What I got was this stuff. It's like a polyethylene vacuum formed product and it's pretty cheap. It's not very inspiring quality wise, but let's see if we can make some lemonade out of this lemon. So I did some tests to see how it bends around corners and it looks like that'll work okay. And I also did a test to see if I could create the top brick profile that wraps around so that it looks like it's a continuous brick. And this was less successful. It's possible, but not easy. I think getting a good edge there is gonna be difficult. So I'm gonna to need to do something different, I think with the treatment of the top there, but I'm gonna roll with this for the sides and see what we can do with this stuff here. I also did some painting tests because it's very cartoony looking as you would expect to start with. So I came up with a painting ritual that I liked and I'll go into more detail on that here in a minute. Then I also did some gluing tests to see what kind of glue is gonna hold as it bends around the corners and regular wood glue actually turned out to work very well. So I went with that 
and I just cut a strip to fit on the first section here and I'm using one to three blocks to kind of hold it around the sharp corners and then I just let that cure overnight. I took my time here and I went one section at a time to make sure the previous sections were fully cured and I used parallels and machinist blocks to kind of create sharp corners here. The trick is to get the plastic sheet to kink in exactly the right place that you want it to and if you do that it makes a nice result. So this was a little tedious, I just worked my way around very slowly. If you don't let it fully cure between each major bend around each corner then it's going to come loose and it's going to get bubbly and you're going to have a mess on your hands. So patience was the order of the day here. There's two seams here and to hide those I put one of them in an inside corner and the other one I cut the profile of the bricks out to interlock them like saw teeth and that will go underneath the, where the cylinder sticks out so it won't be very visible. Let's talk painting now. First step is just to kind of add some texture and some variation, knock down that kind of solid brick color that it has. And for that I'm using a sponge and some brown paint. The paints here are all Vallejo acrylics. It's very, very nice paint. And then with that texture added, then I'm going to do a dry brush where you just put a little bit of a bright color on the brush and basically wipe all of it off on a paper towel. And then very lightly brush over the surface and just it just catches the high spot with a little highlight of color. And then I mixed up a couple of custom colors and painted in some accent bricks. If you look at real brick walls, there's certain bricks that are distinctly different colors. So I did a few different variations here. And don't worry about getting paint on the mortar, you can just wipe it off with a Q-tip if you do. And as I went along, I just kept adding a little more orange or a little more black or a little more brown to get different shades and I just kept adding occasional accent bricks. These techniques are not difficult, by the way. There's very little skill involved here. If you want to know more about this style of painting, uh, go check out Kathy Millett. She does awesome diorama and model railroading videos. I got a lot of inspiration for how to do this from her and I'll link to her below. Now with that thoroughly dry, now it's time to tie it all together and you do that with a wash. So this is a very thin mix of black and water. So it's very, very thin black and you just liberally wash it on. You pretty much can't put too much on of a thin black wash like this and it just ties everything together, knocks down all the bright colors and gives it a real lived in kind of look. And here you can see where we started and where we finished. For the top of the base, I picked up some polystyrene and I'm going to try to create a cap that sits on top that looks like maybe something somebody made out of wrought iron just to protect the brick from the water and so on of the engine. Now unfortunately I did not have the proper polystyrene solvent glue on hand and I couldn't get any ordered in time so I did some tests with what I did have on hand which was uh, acetone which is a solvent for polystyrene, super glue and ABS pipe cement because ABS is a close relative of polystyrene and the uh, super glue seemed to work the best with the acetone a close second. So I set the base upside down and just cut pieces to length and glued them together to each other but not to the brick and then they just worked my way around. Polystyrene is really easy to work with. You just score it with a hobby knife and it snaps very, very cleanly and leaves nice edges. The results are very much down to your skill with a craft knife though. And what I'm doing is creating a little frame as you can see there. And then I turn that upside down on the sheet stock and I just cut around that. So I'm scribing a cap that's going to be tailored to the size and shape of the brick basically because the brick isn't perfectly straight, the wood isn't perfectly square, you know, there's a little variation in everything. So this just ensures a perfect fit. And then I kind of sealed up the joints by washing everything with acetone in there and let that solvent uh, meld everything together. And then I had to cut a hole down the center for the trench. I really should have done this before I put the sides on. That would have been easier, but I was able to sneak it out of there. For paint, I was going to go with flat black. And then I found this stuff in my paint bin. It's called flat soft iron. I don't know. I'll give it a shot. I mean, iron sounds in the ballpark of what I want. So I went ahead and sprayed that on there and I think it turned out great. It's a touch on the sparkly side. It is a metallic paint, but if it bothers me, I can tamp that down later with a little bit of sponge treatment. 
But uh, I did also do a painting test on this with some scrap to see how well it adheres to the styrene. And the answer is very well. You can scrape it off if you try hard enough, but it's flexible and uh, seems to hold very well. So I didn't have the proper styrene primer, so I wasn't sure how well that was going to work. Next up, I need some kind of a grill to cover the drain. And so I've got this brass mesh here, which I tried to cut with side cutters. And eh, that worked okay, but it was going to distort it a lot. So the Dremel actually ended up working the best here. This brass mesh is expensive, but the piece you see here is basically a lifetime supply for model engineering. So the idea is this will cover the drainage trench like so, and then the cap will go on top. Now I'm not going to glue the cap in place because to be honest, I'm not convinced that I love this cap and I may want to do something different later. So it'll just be held in place by the engine. It's pretty good. The craftsmanship on the plastic cap there is not awesome, but I'll roll with it for now. So I centered up the engine on the base there and then I transfer punched all of the holes from the casting. I set it up on the mill for this and I'm just taping the cap in place so it doesn't shift or get lifted by the drilling. And I want to drill through everything all at once just to guarantee that I have all the holes lined up and matching where they are on the engine. I drilled them all to a calculated depth using the Quill DRO and I'll do a little test fit with the studs to make sure I have the right stick up. And that looks good. And a test fit with the engine and that looks like that is going to work. The holes are a, a generous uh, fit on the studs. There's plenty of slop there, and that guarantees that A, I can get them to line up with the casting, and B, there's room for the epoxy that's going to hold them in place there. So they're going to end up being effectively self-aligning. So I put some washers on the base for a spacer, mixed up some epoxy, dipped each stud in there, and then those just float in the holes. And then once they're all in there, I clean up the excess epoxy and then the washers keep the epoxy from touching the base so it doesn't get glued down. And then the base just holds all of the studs in alignment and vertical. And then once that's cured, I pull that off and everything's perfectly aligned and I didn't have to measure a single thing. And at the last moment, I realized I'm going to need some way to attach this base to my steam plant someday. So I found these threaded inserts in the drawer. I don't love this style of insert, but I have a bunch of them, and so I want to use them up. So I drilled those and tapped them in place. Okay, hopefully final assembly here. So the mesh goes under, cap goes on, engine goes on, and now I can put my little nuts on there. So I put them all on and then tightened them in a circular pattern just to keep everything nice and straight and even. And that is looking pretty sharp. Okay, so far so good. Next up are the studs I made for the bearing caps, and these get a little bit of Loctite on the base. To install them, I'm doing just what you do with real studs, which is to double nut them and use that to twist the studs in because they're too small to get a good grip on. With all eight of those in there, now I can put the crankshaft back in, put the bearing caps back on, and here you can see where those little flat-sided washers come into play. They give me just the clearance I need to get those tiny little nuts in there without touching the casting. Snug those down and the crankshaft is installed. I also made new gaskets because the ones that I'd made before were a little bit on the leaky side, so I took more care this time. Hopefully they'll be better. And here's a good example of where the studs and nuts come into play. They don't just look better, they're much, much easier to work with when assembling and disassembling the engine. These screws on the underside of the cylinder were almost impossible to reach with a screwdriver, but now I can come in here with a wrench quite easily. And now I can reassemble the rest of the engine. I'm calling this engine done, so let's inaugurate it with a steam up. I've got some leaks there. I remade all the gaskets and repacked all the glands, so things still need tightening up a little bit. I'm very pleased with that Pour 15 engine block paint. I think that worked out really well. The color came out great and it's proving to be very durable. It handles the heat no problem and I've smacked it with wrenches and stuff and it uh, doesn't chip or scratch or anything. And let me just say after this video, I did end up tightening everything up and sorting out all those leaks. And if you please, a moment of silence for all the brave and weird fixtures that gave their lives to bring this engine to life. 
Future plans for this engine include being built into a steam plant with its own dedicated boiler so it can do some real work. And that is gonna be a future video series. But for now, I'm super happy with this engine. It's running great, looking great. I hope you enjoyed watching me make the base and frankly, the rest of this engine. If you like this series, throw me a little love on Patreon. There's a link in the description and a card here on the screen. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.